occurring April 18th through the 25th this year in New Orleans. Uh, so we hope to see a lot of you in attendance uh, as we deep dive into the topics that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so today we have uh, Joe Moles from Red Canary. Uh, Joe is an IR and digital forensic specialist. Uh, he has more than a decade of experience running security operations and e-discovery. Uh, he's the Director of Detection Operations at Red Canary. Uh, he leads a team of security analysts to help organizations defend their endpoints against threats. Prior to joining Red Canary, Joe built and led security operations, incident response, and e-discovery programs for Fortune 500 companies like Office Max and Motorola. Uh, also presenting today, uh, myself, Rick McElroy, security strategist for Carbon Black, 19-year uh, security veteran, spent some time over in the DOD space, uh, but really specialized in building rapid security operations programs uh, and going from a zero maturity uh, to a high level of maturity as fast as possible. Next. Awesome. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, so we're going we're gonna to ask the question what threat hunting is. We're going to talk about automating threat hunting. Uh, and we're going to talk about how it's, automation of the hunt is not what most people think it is and then how to build this practice into your security operations. Next. So uh, why, why do we threat hunt? Well, we threat hunt because adversaries have changed, right? Uh, we have nation state, state actors that are out there. Uh, their tools are now being uh, made public uh, and in the hands of uh, everyday cyber criminals, right? We have the cyber criminal uh, teams, we have hacktivists, uh, insiders, and then finally, you know, I think an often ignored uh, group, uh, which are script kiddies, right? So people who pull tools off GitHub, publicly available things, point them at your systems, and attempt to do harm. So what is threat hunting? Threat hunting is the practice of actively looking for anomalous activity that has not been identified by your existing tool sets by searching through various sources of data. Threat hunting is the process of actively searching with an environment for evidence of previously undetected attackers. So I think the biggest point I would make here is that threat hunting is a proactive practice that involves humans and technology to seek out bad in your environment. What should the goals of threat hunting be? Well, the first goal should be to identify solid evidence indicating the presence or residual activities of attack attackers within a network or computing environment. You wanna use threat hunting to assess your existing security and, ne and network security tools and identify gaps within process, people, technology, and education. And you wanna improve your prevention and detection as a result. Threat hunting should, uh, as you're out there threat hunting, it should identify gaps in your program uh, that the, you're then able to quickly close. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Joe uh, for the next couple of slides. Yeah, so, so like Rick mentioned, you know, threat hunting really, a lot of it comes down to it's a, it's a continuous ongoing process. It's continuous, and it's a continuous improvement effort. Um, so you're looking for a bad thing, you're finding a bad thing, and you're figuring out how to find it faster. And you keep doing that over and over, and it's, you're working on, we're talking about using the, that activity of actually delving into your information to, to look for those bad things, however you've heard about them, however you thought about them, you know, finding those things in your environment, taking action on them, and then figuring out within your tool set, within your security program, how do we do that faster next time? How do we continually improve based on the, the things that we found this time? How do we find it faster next time? How do we get that in front of my analyst? How do I get that in front of my security team? How do I even automate that so that you know, my people can find the more advanced things next time. So, you know, it's how do we get there? You know, starting at kind of the, the least effective way, it's, you know, it's a, you know, taking an ad hoc process, going as a one off, digging in, looking for things that you found in a new, in a new report, things that you say, hey, I wonder what this looks like, or hey, this, some activity I just happen to notice that smells a little funny, I've got a hunch. Um, you know, just kind of poking at it when you got free time. You know, then working all the way up to full automation, letting the tools do the work for you, um, and not for not thinking for you, but you know, getting that information in front of you so you can take action on that and, and getting ahead, uh, working towards the easy things, the things that you know about 
you should let your tools find those for you so then you can continue to dig in and find the things that your tools don't know about. It's, you know, and this is kind of a, you know, uniting technology and people. I mean, people have, you know, there's a power in people and there's a power in tools. Uh, and we want to bring those two, those two ideas together, augmenting that, that human capacity to identify things, to work through complex problems, to do that analysis, but allowing the machine, the technology, whatever that is, to augment that ability and really bring those to the strengths of both of those together into one you know, unified effort. So I'm going to pass it back to, to Rick here, and we're going to kind of just talk through some layered approach to threat hunting. Yeah, um, you know, at Carbon Black, our philosophy is really this. Um, you build on top of the, the pieces that you have in your program, right? And for us, everything starts with visibility. If you're not collecting the right data from the right assets, uh, there's simply no way to start enabling things like alert triage uh, and threat hunting. So we're going to break this, these kind of layers down and talk about the impacts to threat hunting. Uh, and how you get there, right? So the first one we're going to talk about is visibility, right? So you got to you got to collect the right things to analyze the right data. Uh, if you're not, uh, I would say step one is drive the visibility, right? So so if that's on the network, drive the visibility on the network. If it's on the endpoint, awesome. Collect the right security data so you can start to analyze that. Uh, and here's why, right? Um, take a look at the picture. Can anybody tell me who caused that accident based on the picture? Uh, I would say no, right? Uh, I, you know, if you're not collecting that data and understanding the traffic patterns, uh, you're, you're simply not going to be able to stop things like this from occurring. Uh, however, uh, when you start to drive the visibility in your environment, what, what you see is uh, some normalization, right? You see patterns of things that occur. Uh, and I think it's much easier to detect, say, someone driving uh, across the track uh, in a NASCAR model than it would be in the previous picture. Uh, so for us, you know, again, it does become about the visibility because it's the foundational layer that everything on top of it is built on. All right, we're going to talk about how that is associated with uh, the attack kill chain um, and specific to things like uh, IOCs, patterns of detection, and that type of stuff. And with that, I'll hand it back to Joe. Yeah, so, so good starting point. So getting that visibility in your environment, looking through your data sources, you know, some of the first, you know, low-hanging fruit attack you know, uh, ideas that you can you can kind of attack is you know just basic indicators do you have you know threat intel feeds do you have things that other tools have you know that you already have automated that I've identified for you you know so looking at those things feeding those into your system you know raising those up and then also you know looking at the the behaviors of those items that you've previously previously identified again we're talking leveraging technology that's already potentially in your stack and in getting that information in front of your humans and your team and letting them start identifying you know that you know what they got out of that information <coughs> so again looking at basic indicators you know indicators they're they're usually pretty easy to run through your environment and then looking at you know those patterns of behavior you get you know, things that you've already found or things, you know, everybody gets the reports and the blog posts and everything and looking through that information, not only taking those hash values, those IOCs, those IPs, all that kind of information that ever, that, that's there and it's got value, but also read through that report. What does this look like within my tool set? What does this look like as a behavior within my, my environment? Uh, one of the you know great ways I think and I refer to this and I've referred to this on other talks is the the MITRE's attack matrix. I think this is a great framework for understanding those behaviors of hey attacker got in my environment, what are they going to do? Um, other other good frameworks. Everybody knows the kill chain model. Look through these. You know, look you know start laying this next to next to your 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 tool set next to your team and say, okay, let's step through this, let's step through this in the environment. Let's look for these kind of activities. What does this look like in my environment? What does this look like in my tool set? And work through that systematically. Also, you can use that as you're going through and look at it as a gap analysis um, <coughs> you know, to identify within your, 
uh, within your environment. And just kind of switching gears a little bit, got a question that came in. Uh, the question is, do you have some good resources for determining what kind of data from an endpoint is most relevant from hunting? Where can, you, where can we get the most bang for the buck in terms of visibility? So from a visibility endpoint, in, in uh, visibility aspect, uh, I'm a big fan of the endpoint. Uh, that's the data that I work with. Um, I imagine Rick, you know, you know, you probably agree with me, but you know, uh, you know, we both work for you know companies that focus on the endpoint. Um, within that endpoint data, uh, you know, there's a lot of different places that you can that you can kind of jump off from. Uh, what I, the kind of the direction I tell my team uh, when we're doing development on trying to come up with new behaviors, looking at a new environment, is you know, let's take something that we already know about and pick the the smallest unique behavior that we can find and then look for that behavior within within an environment. And then we start stacking up those different behaviors that we see. So hey, maybe it's a an instance of PowerShell running a certain command line flag. Okay, let's see everywhere that we've got that going on. And then when we find, you know, some of it's going to be good, some of it's going to be bad, but you know, the ones that are bad, let's see what other behaviors then followed on before that and after that and add that to our, add that kind of to our stack or our list of behaviors that we're looking for. Or again, I point back to, uh, point back to the attack matrix. There's a, if you go through their, their web page, there's a lot of really good information of, hey, use some basic attack behaviors at these different stages of, of a, a compromise you look at those within that that endpoint data, and then use that as a pivot point. Yeah, Joe, that, that that's a great point. I mean, I was going to bring that up, right, and say, uh, yes, you can use attack uh, frameworks to reverse uh, all of the visibility that you would need, right, to to actually detect those types of attacks. Um, you know, I'm a little jaded. I work for Carbon Black, uh, and that's what we do, right? We're 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 big on visibility. So so yeah, you want to look at cross processes. Right, so when a process kicks off another function or process, that's an interesting uh, uh, security metadata that you want to collect. DLL changes, those are interesting from a security behavioral perspective. Registry changes, what user ran, uh, what process at what time, uh, those are all things that you absolutely need to collect uh, to get that definitive answer, right? Because I know for me, um, and part of the reason that I came over to Carbon Black, uh, is I had these unanswerable questions on my endpoints for years. Right, and uh, we, you know, I kicked off internal projects. We wrote a bunch of code. We bought a bunch of tools, uh, and still couldn't answer the fundamental question of like what actually occurred on that endpoint. So, could we drive to ninety percent accuracy? Yeah, but ninety percent in our world isn't good enough. I need that last ten, right? So, so I think uh, looking at the fundamentals of what you actually need to record, uh, so you can do detections along the kill chain or uh, the attack framework, is is where you want to be. Yeah. And here, just you know, there's another slide that talks, you know, just kind of reiterates some a lot of these data points. Looking at these, so you're looking at some high-level behaviors. What does that look like? And again, think about it within you know, the tool sets that you have. You know, do you have you know a carbon black, or do you have another endpoint tool that can provide you that visibility? Look at you know, look for these behaviors within. Uh, within those environments and you know start working down through those figure out what that looks like what ha appears to be normal and what what's not some of these are very you know uh, in, when you dig into endpoint data some of this these types of behaviors looking at it from that telemetry standpoint get to be super noisy um, and then one of the questions that came up from the audience is how much time do you do you have to focus on indicator based detection compared to behavioral based it seems to be the industry is split on the uh, efficiency of threat intel feeds. So, so for my for my for my team, we use threat intel feeds. Um, you know, most of our detection is focused on behavioral information, but threat intel feeds are there's a lot of value there still for for that type of you know quick win detection and quick win you know validation. Hey, is this I can quickly check within you know within a tool. I can say, hey, let's see, has I have I seen this MD5 anywhere in my environment? No. Okay, good. But you know, I can, and then I can also easily feed that in. You know, it's a quick win from an automation standpoint. You know, I can say, you know, here are these here's this list of MD5s, or here's this list of domains. I can quickly add that in either from a prevention standpoint. So maybe it's a bunch of known bad IPs. 
you know, push that out to my network team, put that in my proxy, put that in my firewalls, just shut that down right away. You know, from a tool like you know, Carbon Black, I can take those MD5s, I can do a quick, you know, create a quick watch list, I can do a quick query and identify those information and do some quick wins. If I do find that information, I can take quick action and, you know, one, stop that right away, but then two, I can look at that behavior around that and then learn from that and use that to drive more in-depth detection going forward. Yeah, and I think um, just secondarily to that, a couple of a couple of things I, I kind of thought of as, as Joe was running through, right? So the first thing I'll say is um, pet, bring in your pen test teams and pen tests for your gaps, right? So if you specifically want to be able to detect, say, uh, a PowerShell type based attack, once, once the attackers are in your environment, uh, scope that for your red teams, right? Or, and if the red team can't do it, go find one that can. Um, that should reveal your detection gaps on the back end, which should give you a short list of projects to go run through, whether that's buying a piece of technology like Harm Block to, to close a visibility gap or uh, doing that through some other mechanism, uh, I, I think is huge. And then, and then I think the last thing I'll say about IOCs versus uh, behaviorals, um, it's a maturity thing, right? So I think as an industry, uh, we weren't doing anything about ind indicators of compromise. Uh, now we've enabled sort of these uh, quick, easy wins, as Joe said, right? So I got a list of bad IP addresses. Let me go in and block those real quick. Uh, but we all know that data is transitory and very easy to change for the attackers, right? Um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit towards the end of the slide, uh, changing the cyber economics behind it, right? So actually making uh, the, the, the attacker's job harder uh, by, by improving the barriers to entering into your environment uh, so that eventually they move on or the attacks that they're hitting you with uh, don't have an ROI, right? Which means they're, they're gonna switch what they're doing. So as, as an example, if we prevented ransomware 100% across the board, uh, there would simply be no people participating in, in the, the cyber economy of ransoming systems because there's no payoff for them, right? So yeah, so I think for, for us, it, it really is, right? And, and IOCs do, lead to patterns of attack, prevention, detection, but really uh, what all of that stuff does is allow for faster triage, right? So, so being able to actually drive to the root cause as fast as possible and say, what happened? You know, did the user click on a malicious link? Were they fished? Did it come through via email? Uh, rapidly being able to collect that data, analyze it, and then say, this is what occurred, which should drive remediation efforts. Right? That should allow you to look at where your prevention dollars are being spent today. Uh, and maybe in some cases, uh, it's being spent incorrectly. So you have upstream filtering that should take care of this stuff, some of the phishing attacks, some of the spam attacks, things like that. Uh, but maybe they're not as effective as they could be. When you, when you have that correct endpoint visibility and you actually see uh, what all that filtering is either doing for you or not, it uh, should be very easy to then justify either an increase in your prevention spend or to look at the, the prevention tools that you have in place uh, and pivot those to different technologies that may have more efficacy. Uh, and here's why. It, it really comes down to this. We, we can't know what's bad ahead of time, right? So uh, uh, next, Joe, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Awesome. So we can't know what's, what's bad ahead of time, right? I mean, we're, we're always chasing the tail of the attackers. Uh, things we know, attackers are innovating wildly. They're moving as fast as they possibly can. And oh, by the way, uh, now we have large or uh, intelligence agencies uh, that have produced lots and lots of really good code and lots of fun stuff uh, that's now in the open market, right? So uh, over 2017 and 2018, uh, my, my personal prediction is most attacks become advanced attacks. You know, we, we talked about advanced persistent threats uh, years ago and sort of started ringing that alarm bell. Uh, now what we're seeing is that actually come to fruition where you see standard pieces of malware uh, using evasion techniques on a regular basis uh, to avoid your other technology, right? So um, prevention is a bit of chasing the tail. Detection and response really becomes about rapidly seeing uh, the unknowns and that, that bottom of the iceberg, uh, being able to put that picture together and then actually uh, drive up your program and, and mature your controls. Uh, next. Yep. So, so yeah, so I, I mean, it, it becomes very key. We talked about uh, collecting the right data for visibility. Uh, and why is that? Well, look, the teams out there are struggling. And I, I've met with probably, over the last two years, I've probably met with 500 plus organizations. At no point in time has any one of those organizations said, 
I have enough people and I have enough time to do my job, right? So, so being able to quickly respond and detect these things uh, and have a short list of alerts when uh, the analysts and the folks in the SOC come in to do their job uh, all saves them time. And, and we'll talk about that time equation again when we get into auto automating this stuff. Uh, but essentially, you need to be able to quickly root cause it, right? So in this particular instance, you know, when Windows Explorer launches Chrome, Chrome then launches Java. That's fairly standard. You're going to see that, you know, hundreds of thousands of times on endpoints, uh, and it's it's meaningless from a security perspective, right? A user is running Java, no big deal. But then Java does something funky, right? And it kicks off CMD.exe, which then starts to execute some malware. Um, now you see the attacker, you know, doing data exfiltration and or lateral movement. They gain persistence in your environment. Uh, now they've got credentials, uh, and they're probably doing some other stuff. Right? So, so being able to put that whole entire chain of events together uh, and rapidly triage and rapidly remediate is really the key to success right now. Uh, next. You want to take this one, Joe? Yeah, yeah. So you're know, just kind of building off of that. So say we've, we've identified, you know, we have, we have that visibility, we've identified the threat. You know, part of this continued process is, is then what do we do after we found it? Um, you know, and first couple of those, you know, those steps are, you know, is, is retrospection and hardening. So looking back at what happened and why it happened, and then looking forward at how do we prevent, how do we reduce that, you know, that attack footprint uh, in the future. <clears throat> so, you know, looking, you know, part of that retrospect, you know, retrospection is, okay, again, thinking about how do I find this faster? You know, do, did we have visibility? Where is that? Where else did I see this? You know, take that time. You know, you find one bad thing. Look for those behaviors. You know, quickly go back, look for those behaviors. Make sure it wasn't wasn't anywhere else in your environment. And then also push forward. And okay, what what do I need to change in my environment to, to prevent that? Is it a is it a user rights issue? Is it a patching issue? Is it a you know hardening on a server issue? Where where was the gap in my in my security controls that I can use to to stop or at least reduce the the risk around that specific uh, pattern of attack that I've now found? Yeah, and I think the the other point I would make on that is um, as you're locking down your environment, right? As you're hardening your environment, uh, it's going to give you less places to hunt. Right, so so if you look at technologies like whitelisting, um, those are going to call a lot of noise in your environment, uh, which means that again, that precious time that we talked about out of the security defenders uh, is better spent on actual alerts, on actual things they need to go do uh, to stop bad. Right? Um, yeah. So all of those layers, right? As we build through the visibility, as we look at adding IOCs, because those are quick wins, right? Joe, I think did a good job talking about that. As we're able to quickly triage and remediate these issues, um, hey, we've got retrospection answering the question, did this ever happen in my environment? How prevalent is it? Uh, we move into hardening, right? Because now we've got better visibility to determine where we should spend our preventative controls. Okay, awesome. So, we, so we've done a lot of manual effort. We've created a bunch of process. Uh, that didn't exist before because we weren't threat hunting. Uh, now I want to make it efficient, right? Now, now I want to be able to do this at scale. Uh, now I want to be able to do it and be independent of, say, my awesome threat hunt team uh, that goes and works for Red Canary, right? Uh, you know, so, so, so you want to make uh, your strategy, and, and you really want to think about this when it comes to threat hunting, right? It, it's got to be a process that exists over the life cycle of your program. Right, so building it as a point in time, dependent on uh, individuals, uh, I would say is bad. Um, you want processes and technology that are going to exist outside of the individuals that are running them, uh, because as we all know, uh, resources uh, leave all the time, especially good senior resources, right? Uh, so a couple of things I'll say about automation. Um, if you could go to the next one, Joe. So the fir first thing I'll say is that the current state of cybercrime shows an extremely profitable market. According to a 2014 report by RAND, the cyber black market was found to be more profitable than the illegal drug trade. In 2011, the UN commissioned an illicit funds uh, report, which found that the largest income from transnational organized crime came from illicit drugs accounting for $2.1 $2 trillion. 
right? So now what we're saying is fast forward to 2014, it's actually more profitable than illicit drugs, uh, right? So, so using that to estimate the size of the black market, um, if you took one illicit drug, such as uh, cocaine, that's estimated to be an $85 billion industry. Um, Google last year brought in about $90 billion in revenue, right? So cybercrime as a whole uh, is exceeding the, uh, the profit and, and, and profitability of Google as an entity. And oh, by the way, it's estimated 1.7 million people uh, are actually employed uh, in this, which would make cybercrime one of the largest uh, corporations if it was held as an entity on the earth. Um, so automation becomes super important, right? It becomes important so that we can change these economics. I talked a little bit about that earlier, uh, but it also becomes important to your team uh, because it scales. And as we know, senior engineers uh, and analysts hate to do manual activities, right? We're professionally lazy and I'm okay with that. Um, I don't think that's uh, saying that is bad, right? So, so look for opportunities to automate manual processes. Uh, kind, kind of my uh, next, yeah, uh, actually, that's a good slide. Um, so, so kind of my, my take with my team has always been this. If you do the manual activity five times and the results come out exactly the same, put it on the short list to automate, write some Python code there, um, or hopefully uh, your manufacturers that are out there are uh, allowing you to do this type of automation. Um, next. Uh, and what that's really going to do is you got to prove it out manually, right? Because if you don't, uh, you're going to run into issues uh, as you scale your program, right? So now we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, we talked about automation, now we're going to talk about orchestration amongst your products, right? So um, optimal state, an alert is generated, say it comes from a threat intelligence feed in this case, uh, you're going to send that over to some type of system to cross check for contents. You know, uh, typically we call these SIMs, uh, but it could be custom written stuff that, that you have in your environment. Uh, it's going to pull things like the device history the user profile and behavior. Now, now you have an enriched alert, and oh, by the way, humans didn't have to touch any of this. So when we talk about uniting man and machine, the machine should really be um, making the human's job more efficient, right? So uh, now that we've got a, a cross-checked uh, alert for context, we've pulled all this information that would have normally uh, been pulled manually, right? So, so you know, maybe the engineer is calling someone on the, uh, on the desktop team to go actually pull that laptop so that they can get the data off of it, right? All super manual, um, waste of time, in my opinion, uh, those should be automated. Uh, because really, what it's about is, is getting to remediation steps, right? So identifying the issue, detecting the issue, stopping the bleeding, uh, through isolation and whatever techniques that your team team uses. Um, now you're able to get into killing processes on the endpoint, resetting those credentials, blocking the IP addresses, right, that were involved with, you know, uh, command and control channels. Those are all things that uh, you should be able to do in as close to real time as possible. Um, so, so as you're thinking through your strategy for threat hunting, you definitely want to make orchestration and automation a part of it um, because, again, that's how you're going to get to scale. And overall, that's how we're going to change the cyber economics behind uh, what the criminals are doing. And a couple of questions that come in from you know came in from the audience here. Uh, for, you know, first one here: Do we have any resources that we would recommend to support automation, or are there any resources that I can teach my that can teach me best practices? And then I'll just throw out the other one, and we can maybe answer these both in the same same response. Do you need SEM to support automation and orchestration? And are there ways to set those actions without a SEM? I'll take the second one first. Joe, you want to take the first one? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> so just jumping in, you know, recommended for uh, support of automation, you know, um, I, you know, kind of the, the first answer is yeah. Sem Sem is a great great tool for for automation. Uh, the other thing is you know looking at um, you know looking at certain things that <clears throat> anything that you can script. So one of the things I tell people you know why I you know why I like having humans in the mix is that if I can if I can consistently show that same behavior that same action, then I can I can script it. So. Uh, some of the actions that we take, you know, is some of that low-hanging from things. Is this co consistently showing this behavior as bad? Okay, then I just block that behavior from happening in my environment. That's an easy automation. 
Um, can I, you know, use a whitelisting tool or a blacklisting tool to say, hey, this this software publisher, I don't want that in my environment. You know, some of those kind of controls. Those are the easy, those are the quick and easy automations. Um, so other things, then it gets it, it gets into a maturity thing. You know, can I integrate this into my sim? Is there, you know, do I have orchestration tools or you know control tools or other uh, solutions within my environment? You know, how is my IT controls built around? Can I leverage some of that that type of things? Do I have a a good you know endpoint management tool outside of from my detection capabilities? that I can use to, to, to set up some basic things to start uninstalling, removing, you know, preventing those type of things and, and working with my IT organizations as part of the, that process and automate that process in. Maybe it's a, other things that I've used is, you know, building into my alert sources. If there's, again, low, low things or, or things that I know I can take an immediate response, can I build that into my help desk solution? So, you know, through whatever alerting source or you know, tool I'm using, can I send a quick email over, just, I know this behavior is bad, I know this is exactly what it is, here's the steps. I just want to send an email right to my help desk that says, hey, you know, this person's computer has got this infection, you know, we need to just pull them offline and go clean them up right away, and here's the steps. You know, those are some quick and easy wins to catch that. You know, some of the lower hanging things, but you can get a lot faster response on that. Yeah, th th those are good points, Joe. I, I, I would absolutely bring up things like uh, we all, we all mo most of the industry uses MSSPs or uh, in, in the case of Red Canary, right, you have a managed endpoint detection and threat uh, organization that looks at logs. And, and at some point, they're going to escalate alerts to you, right? So um, even if you took a simple process like an alert's escalated, um, I should know whether that uh, needs follow-up or if it needs to be closed immediately. Um, and looking at your ticketing, your ITIL-based ticketing systems, uh, those should have those capabilities built in. Uh, to answer the question about SIM, if I was looking at buying a SIM today, it would absolutely be a weighted criteria for me um, that there is some sort of orchestration uh, that can occur in that. Uh, and I think you'll see the major vendors moving towards that. Uh, a number of orchestration automation vendors have appeared in the space, right, to sort of solve this problem of not enough tier one resources, uh, can't get them in a sock fast enough, can't train them fast enough to actually do work. Um, I won't plug any particular ones, but I think you could do a Google search and find those. Uh, the other thing I'll say is um, you should have talent on your team for scripting, right? So whether that's Python, whether that's Bash, whether it's PowerShell, um, I think as I was looking to hire new folks to come into my program and mature my threat hunt, those are absolute skills that I would require coming in the door. So I hope that answers the, those questions. Yep. So a couple other couple other questions here. Um, do you have any guidance on um, do you have any guidance on automated response actions when you're not a, when you don't have a hundred percent certainty? In your opinion, should you limit automated response to threats that you're not a hundred percent certain of? Um, I say I, I was going to say my, my answer is it largely depends. Uh, that comes down to a, a risk discussion, you know. Um, you know, is the is the and it depends on what your 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 automated response is. Is it, you know, is it shutting down that you know shutting down a process? Is it is isolating a host? And what's the impact of of a false uh, you know of a false positive in in that event? You know, and so it's a balancing. You know, it, that comes down to a discussion of 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 risk. Which which is the greater risk? In that situation, do you have other response processes that you can quickly respond without doing that automated to get that you know resolved right away, or is there some intermediary? So hey, maybe I can isolate that host and kick a high ticket over to my help desk, have them engage with that user right away and, and assess and assess that behavior and take take action, or is this a production server that's hosting my ecom environment, and if I shut anything down, I shut down business. In that case, I might be a little bit more leery of you know taking an automated response, but I'm also going to be a little bit more uh, you know intent on getting on that box, getting you know get digging in that information and validating that. So again, it's it's balancing that that you know the risk on either side of that. Yeah, I think to add to that, uh, I absolutely agree. It's cultural. Um, I think when you're starting your program, it would probably be a bad idea to react to all alerts and just start like isolating hosts and, and turning off services. Uh, but as you mature, 
right? You should be able to highlight some of these things and go, well, look, the, and I love Joe's point, right? So, so, so I have a server farm. Uh, and one of my, you know, one of my e-commerce server farm gets, gets owned. Um, should, shouldn't I be able to take an automated action on that particular thing if I, if I have reasonable assurance that, that occurred and not take down my website, right? So uh, through some of this process, you may actually highlight uh, other areas that IT needs to improve, right? So uh, having an actual farm, having load balancing that actually works so you can pull systems offline and, and maintain uptime. You know, uh, availability is still part of the, the, the security CIA triad. Um, and so I always, I always looked at it that way um, as I was working with other leaders in IT and other leaders in the org. Uh, there were certain cases that, hey, we're, we're, we're going to isolate this host. May, maybe it's an endpoint. Uh, maybe it's a desktop. Um, and yes, we may impact one user. Um, but here's our reasonable level of assurance. And then to Joe's point, I think you, uh, you step into production systems that have a big impact to your, to your financial bottom line. But in the end, uh, if both teams are working together and the architects of those solutions are sitting down and actually looking at the overall impact, um, you should be able to build that resiliency in there to be able to do those things uh, and still maintain availability. So the kind of moving on from the, from the <coughs> Automation side, um, it, you know, we get back into the actual, you know, into the actual hunting. You know, so the actual, you know, now we've we've gone through, we've done some, you know, behaviors, we triage, we've gone through, and then we get back to the top, which I really think is just we're circling right back to where we started, is you know, engaging in this, um, you know, taking this in a, you know, as a real time, you know, real time activity. You know, and, and, and the, as you mature, this becomes faster and faster, and this becomes very much uh, a real-time activity. So, you know, maybe I've got an alert, I've automated looking for certain PowerShell activities. All right, let's jump right in. Let, as soon as we see that, we start, we've already filtered out, you know, the, the legitimate activity. We know, hey, somebody, you know, administrators using certain PowerShell commands as part of our, our exchange, um, exchange management and some of our server management and everything like that. We can then look, you know, we filter that out of the view. We already know what that looks like. So we can quickly kind of shift gears and, I, you know, see what other activities is this doing? Digging into that, looking in around that activity and finding that, you know, that root cause because now we've, you know, part of this hunting activity is, is, is not only visibility by, you know, tools, but visibility by understanding your environment. So that's the other really great takeaway from going through, having your team go through this activity. Now I understand my environment, so I can continue to refine the knowledge I have of in my environment and what's going on. And we can work down through, again, working down through this whole chain of activity and take, take action as we go along. You know, as we mature this process, we can start, you know, all those steps we've kind of talked about, we can start taking action around those in real time working around around those <coughs> around those behaviors yeah, um, and then to, go ahead Rick uh, yeah I was just gonna say you know it really becomes about the, the the tail end right so so awesome so so we've been able to quickly quickly triage we drove the visibility now we can see the malicious activity uh, we can scope the attack but how quickly can you get that information back into your program and make changes yep. right so so you know agile secure operate you know security operations right so being able to say hey I, I don't have the logs I need to actually go hunt well that should be on a project list somewhere and it should be on a tactical project list right okay step one get the logs right um, you know so, so and we'll talk about this at, sort of at the close of the free zone uh, but it should really be about you know you're not always going to find evil while you're out there right sometimes you're going to identify gaps in your program uh, but that needs to be tracked and someone has to manage it like a program, right? So, so you need to be able to come up with a strategic set of things that need to be done, right? As a result of, of information uncovered during hunting. And then, a, and then you're probably going to have a whole list of tactical things like creating a process to actually go find evil on a, on a Windows box. And here we got a, a related question here. It's kind of somewhat tangential, but I think it's a good question. Uh, while CB is great in my view for cleaning up the environment, would it or threat would it or threat hunting uh, a threat hunting exercise identify let's say malicious items in backups or email archives? 
So in my view, yes. Uh, part, of, part of that hunt exercise is you're trying to find those behaviors. You know, you're, part, you're, trying to, you're identifying something bad going on, but then you're also, it's going back and you know, looking at that. When did this happen? How did this happen? Identifying that. If I find something that, hey, you know, this came in through email, yeah, that's probably one of my action items. Just go back and you know look through, you know look through those files or look through related emails, look through related items in in the environment to identify and clean those up. You know, I've worked in plenty of environments where everybody has a PST. We've got huge email archives and everything, so we should have some way that we're going through and identifying through you know other maybe it's other logs, maybe it's you know going through. You know, working with the Exchange admin, working with whatever, or the backup admin if we found these files on a server or something else, making sure that part of our remediation process and part of our root cause analysis is, is working with those other teams. I think part of a great security program and a great threat hunting program and a great IR program is engagement outside of the security team. Do we have buy-in from the help desk? Do we have buy-in from the business? Do we have buy-in from other IT organizations to, to do follow-up, to, to assess, to, to triage, to do all those steps along this process? We have to, it's, like Rick said, it's part of a program. It should be a company-wide program. Security is the one driving it and maybe doing a lot of the boots on the ground effort, but you know, if we're identifying gaps or areas and things that we need to be able to do, to do cleanup, to do prevention, to do whatever that we need to make sure that all the teams within the organization have bought into that and can leverage that information that we've gained through that visibility, through that hunting action. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, what I would say to that is if you've seen any of my um, kind of in-person talks on creating a culture of threat hunting, right, uh, one, one of the things I talk about is uh, enlisting an army, right? So, so looking at those folks uh, like email admins, um, why not teach them how to go hunt in their own environment uh, so that, that that now lives outside of security. It's a good part of system administration and something they should be doing anyway. But the chances are they're probably undereducated and, and undertrained. Uh, and chances are, you know, given how many people are hosting email, they've probably got some cycles to do it, right? And um, again, I wouldn't say that's going to happen day one, but as part of your overall strategy, you, know, you should look for these areas where you're able to, to, to impart that education and knowledge. Um, and then give them tools to go do that, or um, give them requirements for tools, right, as they're looking at uh, increasing email security. Maybe that budget doesn't live with you, which, which is often the case, and lives over in IT. Cool, uh, you have a relationship where you can go to them with this rated criteria and say, from a security perspective, here's things we'd like to see you guys uh, do, or activities and processes that should exist around uh, this, this particular system. And here I got one more question for us, Rick, and I think this leads into our next slide really well. Uh, for someone just getting started with threat hunting, what are some of the basic behaviors and things we should be looking for? And I think that leads into your, you know, we can, I think we can tail that right into your, your next point here, Rick. Yeah. Yeah, so I, so I think, it, you know, the first thing you want to do is sit down and come up with a plan, right? And yeah, that, 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 that sounds a little cheesy, but, but, but I do believe in that. I think if you just run off and start doing stuff, you're probably not going to have the impact that you want uh, and the time. Uh, you could probably save yourself some time through better planning, right? So, so I think the first thing is to make a conscious effort uh, that this is an activity you need to do uh, because detective controls are currently uh, a failing, right? We talked about the innovation going on in the, in, in the, the cyber criminal and nation states, right? Um, they're evading all of this stuff, right? So they're evading your, your preventative controls. Um, so, so you should absolutely be doing this. Um, so you come up with a plan, right? Um, 30 to 90 days, you're going to start doing things like ad hoc, hoc hunting. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, Joe did a good job earlier about uh, talking about the beginning of, uh, of the threat hunting chain, right? So uh, I have a hunch. I have a hunch that my C CTO and CEO just got back from China, um, and I have a hunch that there's malware on their systems. So I'm going to start with a very limited subset of data uh, and start looking at processes to go find that, right? So I'm not going to I'm going to choose not to, uh, to, to eat the entire pie. I'm going to eat it one spoonful at a time, right? So uh, I think we all know or should know where our high-risk users are. I think we should also know where our control gaps are, right? As a good, as a good program manager, uh, you should know where your gaps are. So those are the areas that you probably want to start hunting first. If you've got good prevention in areas um, and over time you haven't seen things like compromises or breaches, 
cool, you can probably ignore those to start and go looking in these other areas. Um, there's some very helpful tools out there like threathunting.net. Uh, the SANS Threat Hunting and Incident Response Summit ha has a wealth of education that comes out around um, how to actually find evil on certain systems like, hey, behaviors on Linux are going to look like this. Uh, here's how I would go detect that. Right? You're going to create things like a rapid feedback loop. You're going to look at the gaps, like, hey, I don't have visibility in logs, I should probably talk to my boss about that or get funding, uh, or start the discussion of creating this culture. Uh, the rapid fee feedback loop we talked about becoming highly important so that uh, you can actually drive change faster in your programs. Uh, so, so now you've been doing some hunting, you've got gaps identified, hopefully you're starting to work on closing those gaps. Uh, and then really, you know, three months in, you can start to automate. So, so I went and looked for evil on two laptops in my environment six times uh, and the results came out the same and the process that I used was the same. Hugely important that you're following the same exact process to start to automate. Cool. Now I'm going to start to automate some of that stuff through scripting so I can go threat hunt elsewhere. Uh, I'm going to start identifying my tool set to support and streamline that. Uh, 100, 120 days to a year. Uh, again, this is going to depend on your environment. I've seen environments take three years to actually make a purchase, so I hope folks in our audience uh, don't, don't have that large of a barrier to, to actually getting some new tools in. But I'm going to purchase and implement tooling. I'm going to baseline. I'm going to start training. I'm going to do all that good stuff with my staff. Uh, now I get into year two and three, and it's continual process improvement, right? So, so being able to say, the direct impact of me having a thread hunting process, a thread hunting team, and thread hunting tools has led to an increase in prevention, automation, orchestration, more sophisticated hunting. This is where the program leaders are going to start to track metrics, like number of pieces of evil found, right? Uh, whatever you want to call that metrics, mean time to detect, mean time to remediate are going to be key there. Um, and it really just becomes at that point, uh, much like any other part of your security program, uh, it's the constant feed, feedback loop, constant care and feeding, um, and then hopefully enabling your team by getting them some education dollars and sending them to things like the SANS Threat Hunting su Summit, um, which is just invaluable, right? There's tons of threat hunting talks that go down at Black Hat and DEF CON. And, um, so, so yes, you will have to make an investment in education for your people, uh, but that's not to say that there's not a lot of free education out there. So, so a couple of questions here, uh, Rick, um, I'm going to throw out here. So one of the first ones, uh, what's the best practice for around ranking the stream of events that are made visible? As typical, one gets overwhelmed with the volume of signal to noise. So yeah, I'll, go ahead. you want to take that one? Or? No, you, you can start and then I'll, I'll jump in for sure. Okay. So I'd say... One of the things that we do internally, I've done with other teams, is, is and I think Rick mentioned this too, is is, is start small. You're not gonna you're not gonna find everything in the environment. You know, it's the same thing. You don't stand up a a solution and say, "Give me all the turn on all the things and hope to be able to consume that." You know, figure out you know figure out in some fashion what's what's important. Where do you have you know, like Rick mentioned, where do you have known gaps? Okay, why don't you start there? Well, let's get visibility around those known gaps and start working through it. The other thing is part of a maturity program, if you have, as you're automating these things, as you're bringing in tools, figure out a way to track metrics on that. Metrics is huge. You know, measure, measure yourself. How long, you know, what's my false positive rate from this, you know, signature, from this behavior, from this tool? You know, figure out where and use those numbers to drive, one, your confidence in a given tool or detection or behavior or whatever, and then two, where you need opportunity, where there's opportunity for tooling, you know, tuning. You know, hey, this one, this, this, this over here is, you know, consistently hits almost 100% of the time. I know when this fires, it's bad. Cool, automate that. Now you have confidence in that. And then, you know, let's work down from there and, okay, hey, this over here is causing me, it's just constantly noise, 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 noise figure out a way to figure out what is that noise? Is that something that you can you can tune in? Is that something that's known within your environment? Okay, then you need to make adjustments for that. And that should be part of, you know, part of the output of this exercise is, you know, pick up, pick a piece, work down, you know, work it down as far as you can, and then identify both the bad things, but also the opportunities for noise reduction. Yeah, and I think secondarily to that too, um, Hopefully you're doing asset management, 
Right, so hopefully you know where the keys to the kingdoms are, um, and you're able to identify those. Now, now I completely understand because uh, it's it's often been the case in my programs when I'm starting uh, that other areas of the org uh, maybe mature slower than the security team, right? So you so you come in and start a a, a program on day zero. Uh, you've got a number of assets, you've got a number of people, you've got a number of controls, maybe hopefully, um, and one of them should just be good asset management, right? So so. In a lot of cases, you should be able to integrate with your asset management system to understand uh, which systems have more important than the others, which should drive uh, your alerting and at least what you're triaging. Now, yes, uh, I completely understand that this will be manual on the part of the security team until IT matures their asset management. But the other thing I would say to that is coupling it with the behaviors that occur, right? So just, just because I got an alert on, um, well, let's use the scenario of my CEO's laptop. So my CEO get, gets an alert from a, a traditional AV tool, and it says, hey, this was partially quarantined, right? So, oh, something's on there. It, it should really be about the behavior of what it's doing, right? Because just because it's the CEO's laptop, it may be a little more important, but may, maybe he doesn't have access to all of the things that, say, your engineering and, and development team would, like source code. Um, so, so the behaviors of what the attackers are doing becomes... Uh, super critical in, in actually being able to triage the stuff and say, this alert is more important than this alert, and here's why. It's based on the behavior, right? So so mapping back to kind of the kill chain, um, the earliest you can stop them in the kill chain, awesome. If you can stop them during recon, cool. Uh, it's going to make their job harder and probably end the, the, the rest of the attack chain. But I think those two factors for me, kind of like if I had to start at day zero, would be like, what is the asset? What's on it? And what is the behavior that the attacker has taken on that box? And your tools, uh, like when you look at EDR tools, they should do that for you, right? So, so they should be able to, uh, based on these other factors, actually um, triage your alerts based on that. So, all right, a couple more questions here. Um, and I think these two, I think, cluster real nice. One, can threat hunting be done without a dedicated visibility tool, either endpoint or network? And then are there any open source tools that you would recommend? Uh, so I will start by saying this. Uh, this function typically doesn't exist in most security programs, um, right? So you have to start somewhere. So while, while I will always stand on, the best possible stance is to collect all of the right metadata at the endpoints. Um, you're probably not going to be in that state, right? I wish everybody would buy, you know, carbon block response, throw it out there, um, and and you know, get the visibility, but we all know budget, bu budgets are concerns. Maybe you spent some money on firewalls this year and you just don't have it, so you gotta start somewhere. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I would say you have log sources today. Uh, you have DNS logs, you have DHCP logs, you have Active Directory logs. Um, you should be logging things from your, your network, like routers and switches. Those are perfect areas to start um, threat hunting without having the complete tool set that I would argue you need to, to do it. Yeah, I would I would agree with with Rick there. Um, you know, one of my favorites, you know, just from a from a tactical standpoint, one of my favorites is anybody running a Windows environment. Um, you know, turn on PowerShell logging. There's yeah. you know there's some great logging options that aren't turned on by default in your Windows environment that provide a lot of value and a lot of interesting information that you can start using to to get some understanding of what's going on in your environment. Um, you know, in in you have to you may have to kind of tune and tweak and you know which places you're turning on certain things but you know maybe in your you know on your CEO's laptop and the keys of the kingdom server you've got PowerShell logging and then when you're seeing those PowerShell events happening within those Windows logs okay why is your CEO running PowerShell unless you're working for a tech company and he's writing his own code um, you know those those are some you know highly suspect things you know and look again looking for you know, getting engagement, you know, work, work with your server teams you know, and, and understand, help them, you know, understand what's going on and maybe, you know, maybe not finding bad things, maybe just finding inefficiencies. But, you know, again, engage with those other teams to use the tools that are already in the environment built into the operating system, built in, you know, built into the network uh, to look for those things. DNS logs are a wealth of knowledge, you know, get into, you know, pa passive DNS uh, information gathering and everything. This provides a lot of a lot of details and information that you can do kind of right out of the gate without a lot of financial investment. 
Yeah, and um, you know we didn't list them all, but I but I did want to point out threadhunting.net again because um, because I love when the community gets together and we just start publishing. Like, here's the actual steps to go find this malicious process on this particular system, um, which is cool. So if there's any thread hunters out there, uh, I would encourage I would encourage you guys to participate because um, we all can't afford tools. And I know, uh, especially after meeting with the number of companies that I had I have over the last two years. Um, that's just the reality that we're in. Um, so the term I like to use is uh, being a baller on a budget and doing more with less. Uh, so yes, absolutely take advantage of scripts that are out there. Absolutely take advantage of uh, whatever you can to drive the visibility. But I think what you'll find is there's a, there's a reason that, that Carbon Black made a product, um, and it was simply to answer those questions that I talked about earlier that I, I, I couldn't quite get 100% assurance on my endpoints. So I think we're almost out of time. Uh, I did want to thank everybody for joining us today. I also wanted to say hopefully we'll see you all in a couple of weeks at the Thread Hunting and IR Summit in uh, New Orleans uh, that SANS is hosting. Um, wealth of great information. If you're looking at building a Thread Hunting program, if you're, if you're looking for process, and, and frankly, if you're looking to interact with other folks doing the job of IR and Thread Hunting on a daily basis uh, and get to share some of that information, uh, I can't reiterate enough how great that event is. So, um, Thanks, everybody, for your time, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. And just one other thing, for any questions we aren't able to answer, look for a, uh, we'll look out for a follow-up email with some of those questions that we'll, we'll try and respond off, offline.